Hello everyone, I'm Daz and welcome to American Civil War and UK History Podcast. This presentation is available as a video on our YouTube channel and as a podcast from wherever you get your podcasts from. Remember on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and TikTok. And please remember, if you're watching on YouTube, to hit that subscribe button. And joining me today is historian, author and co-founder of Emerging Revolutionary War, Rob Orison. Welcome, Rob. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. And uh, today's discussion is about why the Revolutionary War happens. And uh, so, but before we get into the Red War, um, Rob, would you tell us about how you got interested in history in the first place, please? Oh, wow. Uh, I tell this story quite a bit, and it's, it's, a, it's a funny story. Uh, for those who are watching in the States, um, when I was a very young kid, five or six years old, my grandmother used to babysit me or watch me during the day and she loved this old house which is a tv show that was on pbs bob vila they would go to these old houses and she would watch this show religiously and so here i am this little kid watching all these old houses being you know preserved restored and reused and that's where i point my point to when i got interested in history it's kind of a silly silly point but as i think far back that's that's my first exposure to um, history and preservation. I'm really a preservationist at, at heart. Uh, my parents talk about when I was like seven or eight, I always said I wanted to work at a museum when I grew up. And I'm one of those few people that actually get to do what I said I was going to do. So it's it's a long history there of, of my interest in all history, not just American history, but world, world history as well. Excellent. Okay, let's delve into the uh, Revolutionary War then, or the Rev. All right. And uh, anyway, so to understand the Rev War, um, you've got to look at the French and Indian War, um, from what I understand. So tell us a little bit about what that war was about and then the implications that will follow that, please. Wow. Uh, French and Indian War, or the Seven Years War, uh, you know, it's just another one of the wars between uh, – the, the British Empire and the French, right? It's it's not it's not the first time, obviously, as your viewers know, that these two uh, empires were fighting amongst each other. And of course, the the settling of the North American continent um, and these cultures just running into e each other, not just French, not just Canadian, not just British, but also the Native Americans here in North America, all the and the Spanish as well. All these cultures are clashing over this new land um, opportunity. Obviously, money is a big driver of this. Uh, so, uh, you know, the the British were selling on the uh, on the eastern seaboard, the thirteen colonies as we know them today, pushing west. Uh, the French had settled Canada, pushing south, and they constantly are running into each other um, in what's called the Ohio country, which would be today Western Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Ohio, uh, out to even as far west as Detroit. Uh, and I know this is a very North American centric view of the Seven Years War, French Indian War. It, it's actually, I believe, the first world war um, you know, that, that we've experienced here on the planet. But uh, since my expertise is the North American version of it, I'll, that's my focus. Uh, but anyways, these cultures are all clashing and, and eventually uh, with this long history of warfare between these two empires, uh, it, it's going to spark off in, in Western Pennsylvania, which... Uh, back then would be considered uh, Western Virginia. Virginia extended all the way to the Great Lakes at that point in time. Uh, a little unknown Virginian, uh, George Washington, who no one knew at that point in time, um, is going to uh, attack a French uh, party. Uh, there's a lot of debate whether or not these men were uh, searching for Washington for aggressive reasons. The, they would say later they were an, uh, a peace envoy, a diplomatic mission. Either way, Washington and his uh, Indian allies will attack this French uh, party at a place called Jumonville Glen, uh, just uh, east of a place called Uniontown, Pennsylvania. And uh, Butcher uh, slaughtered many of these French, the Native American allies of the British, uh, uh, kill many of the wounded. Um, there's a there's a scene there that Washington writes about where one of the Native Americans opens up the the head of one of these French officers and bathes his uh, his face in the brains. And so I think that was a big shock for Washington. Um, but anyways, this this event, which is small, 
but it just it sparked this 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 war uh, that was already brewing. Like I said, these cultures and these empires were were colliding um, out in the west near the Blue Ridge Allegheny Mountains, and so uh, that's the spark. And then soon after that. Uh, the British are going to send Edward Braddock, a, a, a general from the British Army, over to North America, to Virginia, uh, with their aim to capture uh, Fort Duquesne, which is modern-day Pittsburgh. It would be called Fort Pitt once the British capture the fort, uh, but uh, the British are, are massacred on their way uh, to Fort Duquesne, and then the war just explodes from there. And obviously, uh, most of the war is actually going to be fought on the North American continent side up in the Canada, New York uh, sections of the colonies. Down here in the southern sections of the colonies, not a whole lot going on after the British will capture uh, uh, Fort Duquesne. But it's a, it's a war that's fought for seven years. Many call it the Seven Years War. And it really uh, somewhat settles the... Uh, disputes here in North America between the French and the British. Uh, the British Empire will win, will win the war and push the French almost completely out of the North American continent, uh, which is going to play a little bit of a role in why France gets involved in the American Revolution. Uh, but what it also does, it puts the British crown in heavy, it puts it heavy in debt. Uh, so you find now after the war that Great Britain and, and the empire need to find resources to kind of fund uh you know paying for this long war which they saw was uh to the benefit of the north american colonies and we'll start to see the disagreement there how they either tax or, or get the money they need to pay off these debts and how they look to the north american colonies uh for for those resources so that's a very quick 30 second view of the french and indian war but uh yeah, you could do a whole podcast on that. You could, yeah. But they're fantastic anyway. Thanks for that. And uh, I, I know you mentioned, obviously, the cost uh, to Britain. But um, what, what's always interested me is, obviously, after the war, you get to, you know, you start seeing some of these acts, which we're going to talk about in a minute, uh, come along. But how did they govern themselves before this, you know, some of these acts started coming in the, uh, the colonies? It's it's really it's really up to each colony. I mean, each colony is different. It's not up to the colony, I should say, but each colony is different. As these colonies are set up, um, they're set up differently. Here in Virginia, we're a rural, rural colony, so <clears throat> excuse me, the, the the king will appoint the governor of the colony. But colonies like Massachusetts, which I know we'll talk about here shortly, um, they kind of had you know autonomy to a sense. They were able uh, to to kind of rule themselves and. Obviously, Great Britain had a role in that, but they were allowed more to be kind of self-autonomous. Uh, like I said, here in Virginia, <clears throat> excuse me, South Carolina, North Carolina, uh, a lot of the southern colonies were more royal colonies where the king and parliament are much more involved in how those colonies are run day to day. A lot of the New England colonies have much more autonomy. And a lot of that stems from religious uh, freedoms and the reason why the colonies were established. Virginia is established for money. There's no no way to get around that. Some of the New England colonies were you know, religious uh, colonies set up for these religious sects that were looking for a place to go and settle outside of, of Great Britain. So a lot of that uh, kind of instills that autonomy in those New England colonies. Okay, thank you. And uh, as you're saying, so as I was saying <clears throat> a minute ago about the acts, so there's a lot of acts that have passed over this uh, time. Right. But um, we're only going to concentrate on a couple of the more important ones. And uh, one of the ones that comes in in 1765, I believe, is the Stamp Act. So just give us a little bit of an idea about the, what that entailed and, and, and what the Stamp Act actually was. So um, when you study these different acts and taxes, as we'll get into this, looking back from a modern perspective here in the United States today, a lot of these different acts seem small and trivial. Uh, we're used to paying fees and taxes on certain things today that the colonies, the colonists were never exposed to at that point in time. So it's always difficult for us to interpret these acts and these, these taxes to a modern audience because they're like, ah, well, they have, sure they should be paying a fee for this, that, and the other. Um, but the Stamp Act, uh, really a lot of historians point to the Stamp Act as what really starts uh, the revolutionary fervor uh, or, or the push for independence, um, especially in New England, 
but in all the colonies. So basically, and you have some great images here on, on your screen, um, it's you have any official documentation, official papers uh, that, re that are required to go through the colonial government would require a stamp, and you have to pay for that. Um, and this was an additional tax that Great Britain instituted um, in their defense to, to kind of formalize a lot of these processes that were happening in the colonies with different formal government papers, uh, you know, wills, marriage licenses, et cetera. Anything that's a government uh, form that you would consider today would have to have this, this stamp. You have to pay a tax for it. Um, you saw almost immediate uh, uh, response to this, negative response to this. Uh, here in Virginia, the uh, people of Williamsburg wouldn't even let the tax collector, the stamp tax collector, even uh, get off of, off the ship here and, and, and get, get to Williamsburg. Um, they, you know, the, the, the tar and feathering that you that you read about wasn't as prevalent as as the media would think you make you think it was, but it was always a threat. Um, and many different towns up and down the East Coast uh, really would boycott, would actually, you know, use violence to, to keep the tax collector from, from doing their job. And it's interesting because uh, when this act was passed, being a tax collector was a very, you know, great opportunity to make some money. Um, There's so few government jobs back then pro provided a good pay. And this was one of them that would provide a good pay. So you saw a lot of, uh, you know, government officials looking forward to, to serving in this role, but then obviously immediately <laughs> because of the violence, a lot of these groups, a lot of these people, I should say, uh, because of the groups uh, protesting, you know, declined the job. So some of the colonies couldn't find tax collectors, couldn't find people to work the stamp tax because they were afraid of their own safety. Um, eventually, after uh, a lot of arguing back and forth, the act will be repealed. Um, but you know, Great Britain and the Crown and Parliament, I should say, really, I say the Crown, but it's really the Parliament that's passing these acts would remind the colonies that they do have final say on taxes and British policy. So they repealed the act, uh, but then said, well, we're going to go ahead and repeal this, but just, just know that we have the right to do this. And, and you really see this as kind of the beginning of, of colonial pushback uh, to parliament rule. Uh, I, we always say, we're always taught here in the States that it was, you know, King George III was a bad guy and did a lot of bad things. Well, most of the things that the Americans are responding to are from parliament, not the king. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, um, historically, uh, the king pretty much loses his power after Charles right. I loses his head. So, yeah, I always try and help people <laughs> explain that, you know. Charles II yeah. doesn't have the same power, you know. Parliament is right. basically the power, and it still is today. Um, but, yeah, so um, moving on, um, we have another act coming called the Townsend Act. Um, acts, um, but then this will lead to British troops occupying Boston. Um, so just explain a little bit about the occupation of Boston and what that meant symbolically and, and what kind of issues that causes well the, the townsend actually quick is 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 more of a a, a duty on you know uh different uh different items tea paper lead just some other things that the colonies are importing there's it's just adding uh a duty or a tax to that again because great britain is trying to raise money to pay off this immense debt debt that they incurred um through the seven years of French Indian War, um, yeah. So, so soldiers in Boston, and uh, you know, again, this I said this at the very beginning, briefly, but Massachusetts had always uh, somewhat had a self-rule, autonomous government. They, their their provincial assembly was able to to pass laws. They picked their own governor. Uh, you know, as long as the king was okay with it, but they, they were able to to kind of uh, you know, rule themselves, and that that notion of of self rule when you have you know regular uniformed troops stationed in your capital city of Boston, one of the largest uh, cities in, in the Northeast from New England, I should say, uh, really had a huge shock. Um, you know, this is going to Obviously, I think we're going to get to this in a second, lead to the Boston Massacre. But having these British troops in Boston 
which was seen as a sense of security, a sense of providing some kind of, you know, uh, making the town safe from from all these different uh, groups, the Sons of Liberty and other groups that were raising, you know, causing trouble, raising a ruckus, protesting. Uh, this was the you know this was the Parliament and the Crown's decision to provide safety to the entire town. Uh, the British view of this was always. I should say Parliament because Bostonians are British this time. The Parliament's view of all this was this is just a very small minority in the North American colonies that are creating a huge problem. And so they saw as you know these troops coming to Boston as a way to provide security and safety to, to 90 percent that were OK with all of this, that weren't uh, upset or looking to cause trouble that they needed some kind of uh, armed force to keep the 10% controlled and allow the 90% to live their daily lives. Um, it had a negative impact. And, you know, uh, every time Parliament uh, or the Prime Minister would institute a policy, it almost always seemed to have the reverse impact that they were looking for. And this is true with the troops coming into Boston. Mm-hmm. Okay, and you did mention it there, and we are going to talk about the uh, the, Bos- uh, the Boston Massacre now. So uh, to take us through the, the events that happened there and, and, and yeah, what goes on there? Um, you, got, uh, you got a great engraving there. Uh, some of the first American propaganda ever produced. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I, I would say if anyone so – talk about pop culture uh, really quick. Uh, the miniseries John Adams. Which, which played here in the States on HBO, uh, really it starts off with the Boston Massacre. And it's one of the most accurate depictions that I've seen in, you know, in, in media of this event. Um, so you had a group of, uh, a group of men, uh, mostly boys and kids, that were harassing these British soldiers. I'm not saying that the, that the soldiers that were in Boston were always the best behaved. Uh, you know, these, these men didn't want to be there either. Uh, these guys are, are far away from home um, in a place that don't want that doesn't want them. Something that you know uh, a lot of soldiers and even modern wars today can can, can uh, understand and talk about. But uh, it comes to a point where there's there's a, a group of of men that start to harass some British soldiers just outside the state house. That's the the Massachusetts state house there in the background of your engraving, and uh, they start throwing. Uh, snowballs, there's snow on the ground, throwing ice, start throwing bricks, start throwing stones. Uh, the officer uh, orders his men uh, to stand down to kind of try to defuse this situation. But again, these regulars are kids as well uh, in a place that's far from home. Uh, someone fires a shot. And then after that, you know, many shots are fired uh, by the British regulars into the group. Um, not so much like you see here in the engraving. Of course, this, this engraving is done later on as a way to uh, take the event and, and push the Sons of Liberty, which was a group in Boston that was seeking, uh, I wouldn't say seeking independence from the get-go, but seeking more autonomy for the colony and also seeking uh, to defu- you know, get rid of some of these British tax policies. Although I would say groups like the Sons of Liberty in Boston were probably one of the first groups to start pushing for independence before other groups across the colonies were interested in independence. Um, it, it, you know, it does result in the death of several men, one being an African-American, Christmas Addicts, who's uh, depicted there in, in that movie, that mini series uh, called John Adams that I mentioned earlier. Um, so it really gives you a, uh, you know, it's not just these 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 white boys uh, in Boston. There's also there's some mixed race people involved too. Um, John Adams, as I mentioned, uh, you, know, you know, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, the, the miniseries depicts the trial that happens after this. Um, you know, these men are going to be put on trial in Boston. Uh, you know, so they're going to be in an area that uh, you know doesn't bode well for them. But John Adams will will serve. Uh, this, you know, decides to serve as their attorney, as a representation, and he will argue um, all the different facts of the case. Talk about uh, how these British soldiers were not the ones that that began this. They were not the ones that you know that created the, the problem at the beginning. 
uh, goes into you know interviews people witnesses that were there that saw it and and and, and one of the crazy uh, things of history John Adams able uh, to have these British soldiers acquitted um, and you know John Adams really uh, he was well respected not as much as he would be later on. Um, you know, he's a cousin of Sam Adams, who is one of the leaders of the Sons of Liberty, one of the more rabid members of the Sons of Liberty that were kind of pushing for independence. Uh, Sam Adams was devastated that John Adams took this case, but John Adams did it well, uh, represented himself well. And I think Adams did that to show the British that uh, we're all not, uh, you know, anti-British in Boston. We're all not... Uh, crazy for a lack of a better term and to prove to the British authorities that these soldiers could receive a fair trial in Boston and Massachusetts. And they did, and they were acquitted. Um, Adams would suffer a little bit as far as, you know, uh, public opinion, but again, well-respected and obviously becomes one of the leaders of the American revolution later on. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have a little saying here. So radicals will call it the Boston Massacre, while the British will call it the incident on King Street. Yes. <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. I, That's all it was. <laughs> I was just, uh, I have to get too personal. My, my 10-year-old is, was studying American history this year in school and asked me about why they call it a massacre. And I was like, well, you know, that's a good question. <laughs> um, <laughs> Okay. A lot of it, a lot of it is. Uh, I know propaganda is a very strong word to use today in 2023, yeah. but yeah. It, it really was. Uh, the, the Sons of Liberty and, and the people in Boston that were uh, pushing against British policies and looking for independence uh, were very effective in controlling the message. Extremely mm -hmm. effective to the point today that the Boston Massacre is just said as a term. It's just accepted, obviously, here in the States, and no one questions it. And it, by definition, a massacre probably was not a massacre. Yeah, excellent point. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to one of the, the, the uh, most important hacks uh, that uh, upsets me. Um, no, I'm only joking. Um, so um, in 1773, you have the Tea Act come in, and this is going to cause a big problem, isn't it? Because you're going to then have a thing called the Boston Tea Party. So just explain a little bit about that, please. Right, the T Act. So um, this, this 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 law is is one of the more interesting ones that were passed, and it's still kind of confusing, and, and still there's a lot of great research going on in, about it. Um, the uh, East India Tea Company uh, was in serious trouble. Uh, they had way they had produced way more tea than they could sell. They already had lots of debt. Um, it was. A, a semi-royal controlled company, not, not a total private company. Uh, it was semi-run by the British government. So uh, there's, you know, there was some, those in parliament looking for ways to, you know, get the East India Tea Company out of trouble. Um, it's, and the East India Tea Company is an interesting thing in itself. They had their own military. So, and they were the ones really uh, kind of helping settle uh, you know, India, but they had all this tea and, you know, Great Britain thought it'd be a great way to uh, look to the North American colonies to force them uh, to, you know, to, to buy the tea. Um, now, it's interesting enough that the North American colonies were already purchasing this tea and they were already had no issue doing that. Um, but when they were told that they had to is when you start seeing, start seeing the pushback on it. Um, also a big part of the T act is not necessarily the T the T was a big thing, but the T act also started to uh, really clamp down on uh, private tears and smuggling. Uh, John Hancock, one of the richest men in the colonies was known for, his smuggling business, smuggling illegal tea, illegal goods in and out of Boston Harbor that the British Navy and the British customs officials knew about. They just let it happen. Well, with the Tea Act uh, being passed, all these different route, smuggling routes, all these different side deals that were off the books were starting to become, uh, start, starting to get cut back and clamped down on where uh, the, the law 
was being enforced, where it had been enforced before. It's like for anyone watching who has a young kid and you let the kid do what they want all summer and then school starts and you try to clamp down on bedtime, well, you know, <laughs> they're always going to push back. And that, that's, that's what happens here is, you know, the leaders in Boston really push back on this and uh, the leaders in Charleston, the leaders in New York City, all the port cities, okay, uh, Philadelphia, New York, Charleston, South Carolina, and, and Boston are, are some of the, the, the big ones pushing back. And a lot of that um, is not just because they're being forced with the T, but it's also because uh, the authorities are starting to clamp down on all the smuggling where a lot of people are making their money. So that's when you see people like John Hancock get involved. Uh, Sam Adams was kind of the spirit of the revolution. John Hancock was the financier of the revolution. Very rich man. Um, wasn't so much on the side of the Sons of Liberties before the Tea Act. Kind of, you know, friendly with them. Kind of understood where they were coming from. But it's not until the Tea Act was passed that John Hancock really jumped in and and on the side of the Sons of Liberty and others. Um so, yes, the, so the Tea Act has passed. Uh, you'll see tea parties, for lack of a better term, uh, all across North American continents. I know we know about the Boston Tea Party uh, in December of 73, which is the anniversary is coming up here in a few months. Uh, there's tea parties in Charleston. There's tea parties in Philadelphia. There's tea parties in New York uh, where they are trying to stop this tea from being brought in to the ports. Um Charleston doesn't get as, as bad as Boston. They, they were able to, to stop the tea and they take the tea off and they store it. But in Boston, a whole other situation happens. Uh, you know, uh, the, the night of the Boston Tea Party, uh, there's a what's called a public meeting. And Massachusetts really enjoyed having what they called was their public meeting. Uh, the foundation of their government and their society was based on these public meetings. The night of the Tea Party, almost 3,000 people fit into the Old South Meeting House in Boston. Now, if you go to Boston today, go to the Old South Meeting House and imagine 3,000 people in there. I, I can't imagine it. It must have been just tight. Um, but they were debating on what to do. The tea was on these ships in the harbor. And they, uh, there was an impasse, a bureaucratic red tape impasse. Um, the governor... Would not would not allow the ships to leave. He said they had to they had you know they had to come to port. Uh, the captains of the ships uh, can't go back because uh, then they'd be violating you know law themselves. But they were afraid to dock the ships because they were afraid that they were going to lose all the tea on the ships. And most of the captains in 18th century uh, trade would be responsible for all of the you know, items on your ship. So if you were to lose all the tea or all the goods on your ship, you were personally responsible to pay for it. So they didn't want to lose it. Um, so the impasse happens, and the, that night uh, they will, the ships will dock, and a group, no one knows who, some members have been identified. There's, a, there's an effort ongoing right now in Boston to be able to identify the names of those that dressed up. Some say dressed up as Native Americans, as Mohawk Indians, as Braves, uh, painted their faces. Uh, some did, some did not. They were definitely trying to disguise themselves. Uh, they went down the Griffin's Wharf there in Boston. This is an interesting part, too. They went on these ships, and they only got the tea out of the ships. Uh, they didn't destroy anything else on these ships. They just took the tea, and they dumped it into the harbor. Uh, one of the interesting stories is the, the tide was low at that point and the tea started to pile up above the water. And so they sent people down to the water to diffuse the tea out into the, into the harbor because they were worried that people would show up and just take the tea home. So they were trying to make sure the tea couldn't be recovered. Mm -hmm. uh, and because of that low, because of the water level being so low, the tea started to pile up. Um, so there's three ships there. All the tea is poured out. Um, and, you know, when this when this gets back to uh, Great Britain, it is it's very disturbing to the leaders uh, in Great Britain because this is an open act of of defiance, not just you know protesting, not just tar and feathering a tax collector. Uh, this is completely defying Parliament, and they destroyed you know uh, private property on these three ships. 
Um, and it really sets off, in my opinion, some people think the stamp back starts this whole thing toward revolution. To me, the Boston Tea Party and what happens, the Intolerable Acts, which we're going to talk about in a few seconds, when, those, when this happens and those acts are passed, I think the bridge has been crossed. I think at that point, mm-hmm. we're, heading, we're heading to war at that point. Yeah, thanks for explaining that. That's excellent. Um, yeah, and uh, is this why Americans now prefer coffee? Is that, uh, <laughs> I know. I prefer that? tea. Do you like, do you I like don't tea? drink coffee. Yeah, honestly, oh, I, yeah. I can't stand coffee. It's funny. My wife drinks coffee. <laughs> I drink tea. Uh, yeah, but yeah, I mean, <laughs> and I'll be up there. Uh, me and some of my colleagues will be in Boston in December uh, for the anniversary. And uh, oh, they, they're allowing people to dump tea in the harbor. And the East India Company still exists today. And they've actually donated. Uh, several thousand pounds of expired tea that they're letting people dump into the harbor. So, I mean, you can't beat that, right? I love it. That's brilliant. You're going to have fun doing that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, so, yeah, let's get on to uh, 1774 and the Intolerable Acts. And, and uh, this is, like you said, this is going to be the snowball effect now, isn't it? Um, there's no coming back from this now, is there? Right. Um, so the acts are uh, pretty tough. Um, they will close the port of Boston. The port's closed. So about 80% of, of the money people make their living in Boston is off the port, and it's now been closed. So that's, that's not just going to hit uh, the rabble-rousers. That's not just going to hit the Sons of Liberty. It's going to hit everyone. It's going to hit those, you know, lower middle class people that are just, you know, they're rope breakers. They they work the ships. They work, you know, all all this. Everybody's impacted by this. Uh, so that huge that has a huge impact. Um, the second part of it is it dissolves the Massachusetts Assembly. So their self elected government and their self elected governor has now been removed, um, and now. Uh, a royal governor has been appointed, uh, Thomas Gage, who is a military officer. Um, Gage is interesting. He's, he's much liked by the, the colonists in North America. He's been in command of the British forces in North America for several years. He fought in the French-Indian War. He's married an American wife. So he is not seen um, as someone that uh, people dislike. I think that's the reason why he is picked. Um, although when he shows up in Boston immediately, uh, you know, he is shunned and, uh, you know, any, any positive feelings people of Boston and Massachusetts have about Thomas Gage is gone. He arrives as governor. Uh, so the assembly has been dissolved, uh, and the new governor has been appointed by the King and he's a military governor. So that, that messaging, right, is, is strong, um, there's several other things. One talks about being able to quarter British troops uh, in private homes. Uh, this is not really documented as ever happening. Uh, we, you know, we study that here in the States. That's one of the worst things Great Britain did was they forced us to have uh, British soldiers in our private houses. Didn't really happen, though it was part of the act. that It could happen if, if Gage chose to. Um, also, any British official, whether it's a political official or a military official, if they were to be tried in court, they would not be tried in Boston. They'd be tried back in Great Britain. Uh, this is something that really pushed John Adams over the edge because John Adams argued, I was part of a very fair trial here in Boston for British uh, soldiers. Uh, I am proof that they can get a fair trial here in, this, in, in the colonies. Um, but this act said, nope, any, any British official that's charged with the crime will be tried here in Great Britain. Um, one of the foundations of, of not just Massachusetts' uh, legal system, but many of the other colonies was a jury of your peers. That's still a big thing in the states today, that the jury that would be deciding your fate would be your peers. That removes that. That says these British officials get to go back to Great Britain and their, their cases are tried over there. Um, so you immediately see across the colonies, uh, all the various colonies, uh, issue, uh, statements in support of Boston, uh, local counties, local towns, 
uh, will all call for support of Boston. Uh, Virginia declares a day of fasting uh, in support of Boston and Governor Dunmore here in Virginia will dissolve the Virginia General Assembly or the House of Burgesses, and, and they will go down the street there in Williamsburg and create their own extra legal, their own assembly that doesn't have any really authority, but they're still meeting without the authority of the governor, which is huge, something they'd never have done a few years before then. Um, and then you start seeing boycotts. This is a non, not importation, meaning they're calling for everyone in the colonies to not import British goods, to forego the tea, to forego anything that they would have to import from Great Britain, which, by the way, was a lot. The colonies imported a lot of items from Great Britain. And so you were seeing these different you know, colonies, counties, towns, and cities calling for the people in those jurisdictions to not use British goods. Um, some still did, obviously, but uh, it was more of a, of a public showing against these policies. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, also uh, more troops arrive in Boston. Uh, when Gage arrives, uh, you know, uh, more, more regiments arrive in Boston and are positioned and garrisoned there um, in Boston, which is going to lead to a, a bad situation. So, yeah, they're called the uh, coercive acts. They're called the intolerable acts. Uh, you know, but as I said a few minutes ago, uh, you know, I, if you look back, and obviously we can look back at this easy because we have 250 years to look at it. Um, you know, I can see why Parliament did what they did because of the Tea Party. I can see why they did what they did with the Stamp Act. But everything they did had the exact opposite effect of what they were trying to accomplish. Um, it just made it worse. Everything they did made it worse. Um and me and a few of my colleagues were talking about this a few weeks ago, like, okay, it made it worse. What would you have done differently? And I'm like, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Um, but I definitely think somewhere along the line, there was an opportunity to kind of diffuse this situation, but uh, they chose a different route. And you know, the coercive acts or the intolerable acts are a good example of how they chose to, to clamp down on these on these different activities in Boston and the whole colonies, and it really had the opposite effect. Mm -hmm. And I know you said they stopped importing from Britain, but did they start going leaning on other countries like France and to get their goods in? They did, uh, but you know it's such a brief moment in time, right? So this happens yeah. in seventy three. The acts were yeah. passed in seventy four. News travel so slow, right? Yeah, um, and so uh, mostly what they would do. Uh, would try to produce these things at home, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, they probably needed to do anyways, but, uh, you know, they would drink different, they would drink lesser tea, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Washington writes about, you know, trying to trying to grow different types of tea in his gardens in Mount Vernon. Um, obviously, France is watching this. Obviously, Spain is watching this as well. Uh, you know, Spanish are in Florida. They had great sites on the North American continent too. So obviously other empires, nations are watching what's happening. And yes, some of those nations would start importing, but I don't think they would do it openly because the British Navy ruled the seas. Cool. I mean, yeah. the French had a great Navy. Spain had an okay Navy, but Great Britain had the best Navy and, you know, not really wanting to kind of um, take that on head on. No, of course. Okay, yeah. And then um, you have a, a an event that happens called the First Continental Congress. They meet in Philadelphia. So just tell us about who, you know, the important people there um, and what goes on there, really. Um, yeah, so it's held at Carpenter Hall there in Philadelphia. The building still stands today. It's a great historic site if you're ever in Philadelphia. Um, yeah, so they they... The colonies have been working together before. Uh, they worked a little bit together in what's called the Stamp Act Congress to, in response to the Stamp Act. Um, they actually had met for the very first time. The governors of the colonies actually met at the beginning of the French Indian, which started to – before then, you didn't see a whole lot of collaboration between the colonies. So you see this, this slow transition uh, to collaborate more. Um, and so the First Continental Congress is probably, you know, the culmination of all these other meetings that, that have been leading up to this. 
um, you know, each colony is asked to send representatives uh, to Philadelphia. Uh, they, it's very touch and go. They don't have any authority. Um, they don't even, you know, they don't know what their authority is. They don't know what they can do. They don't really have any taxing powers. They don't have any financial powers. They have no military powers. So it's more of a place for these men to, to meet, to discuss what each colony is going through and how they want to kind of uh, react to it. One thing that does come from it is they all kind of agree that they want to stay British to this state. They, they're not looking to leave Great Britain. They're not looking uh, to, to leave the empire. Uh, they, they think that if they could appeal to the king directly, so, you know, go around parliament and appeal to the king directly, they could, they could find, you know, a friendly ear to some of their concerns. Um, it doesn't really happen, but uh, that's, that's their plan. Uh, they do, uh, Ask for all the colonies to to you know pass these non-importation acts to not import British goods or trying to um, hit Great Britain in its wallet, um, where it's worked before, right? The the Stamp Act, the Townsend Acts, all these other acts were passed, um, and the response of the colonies hurt Britain's wallet, and so they think this is the way to get. Some of these acts, you know, uh, some of the course of acts repealed is through not importing British goods, hurting the British merchants. The British merchants would eventually, you know, push on Parliament to repeal these acts. They can openly, freely trade with the colonies again. Um, but I think that ship has sailed, pardon the pun there. But uh, I, I think in the eyes of Parliament, um, what happens in Boston at the Tea Party and some of the other Tea Parties too, like I mentioned earlier, uh, really was uh, like – they wanted to punish the people responsible uh, for what happened. Uh, so the first Continental Congress is amazing in the sense that it's the first meeting of some of these people, Washington, Adams, you know, a lot of the big names are there. The Lees of Virginia are there, uh, Franklin and others. Uh, so it's, it's a great collection of what's going to end up being uh, national leaders and, and the new country. Uh, but they really don't, accomplished a lot because they're not really sure what their authority is to accomplish. Um, these, these colonies now becoming states solely, solely creating their own independent states, uh, send these representatives to Philadelphia, but really don't give them any authority to do anything other than just debate and discuss and make recommendations on how this situation can be, you know, solved peacefully and get back into the get back into the British Empire and, and move forward. Awesome! Wow, I'm learning a lot myself today. Thanks. <laughs> I don't know. This is, I'm, I'm, you know, obviously, I'm doing three thousand foot level stuff. You here, are so. but honestly, it's fantastic. <laughs> I'm really enjoying it. Yeah. Um. Anyway, so um, I know there's lots and lots of important people, but I've picked out a couple, uh, two important people as far as the colonies are concerned, mm -hmm. or America eventually. Um. So you've got John Hancock and you've got Sam. Um, Adams. So just tell us a little bit about these two at the beginning, because these are influential, aren't they, at the beginning of all of this? Right. So you have the, the voice of the revolution and Sam Adams. You have uh, the, the financier of the revolution, uh, John Hancock. Uh, Sam Adams was a great orator. Uh, some say that his interest in this was personal. Um, his dad was a banker, and because of some British banking policies, he went bankrupt. So some people say that Adams never forgave the British authorities for that. Um, but either way, he was a great orator, uh, you know, one of the leaders of uh, the, Sons, uh, the Sons of Liberty there in Boston, which was a group of men that would meet secretly and discuss ways to uh, you know, oppose British authority. Uh, John Hancock, as I mentioned earlier, was uh, very, one of the richest men and the North American colonies, one of the richest men in, in Massachusetts by far, and uh, made a lot of his money off of shipping. Uh, some of that was smuggling, and I think a lot of us believe that that may have played a role in his interest in, in, in what was leading up to the Tea Act there. When the Tea Act was passed and smuggling is camped down, uh, obviously Hancock is impacted directly. Um, but Hancock was well-respected by everyone, uh, not just... Uh, you know, the American colonists, but also the British authorities. He was a man of means. And so I think when Hancock 
you know, put, you know, goes with the Sons of Liberty um, and goes with what's called the Whigs. Uh, today we call them Patriots, but they really called themselves Whigs back then in the 18th century. Um, I use Whig in some of my book and people have asked, what does that mean? So I think it's better. I need to do a better job as an author to explain what a Whig was back then. But uh, for, for lack of a better term, the Whigs are the ones that were really kind of opposing some of these British policies. And so when Hancock cast his lot with them, it gave it a little bit more credibility. It just wasn't um, a bunch of rabble rousing, you know, loud mouth, just cr- trying to create trouble. It's someone that actually had means and someone that had stature in society. And so when Hancock joins this group and uh, starts to fund it, uh, you find more people in Boston, uh, early, you know, start to support this movement. As I mentioned earlier, um, you know, a small percentage of the citizens in Boston before the Boston massacre had any problem with Great Britain. Most people had no problems at all, but you see that percentage grow over time in response to some of the things that parliament does. By the time when Hancock kind of goes with that movement, um, it adds credibility to that movement. And then you start seeing that become more of a majority of people um, in Massachusetts. We always say Boston was a hotbed for the revolution. Actually, the hotbed of the revolution is the, the, the communities outside of Boston um, that are raising their own private militias in 1774 and 75. Uh, they're funding their own, uh, a lot of it because of Hancock, funding uh, their own uh, purchase of, of military supplies uh, to fund, you know, t- to arm their own militias. Um, Hancock and Adams will be part of the, the group that will create a, a Massachusetts Provincial Assembly. So, as I mentioned earlier, when the Coercive Acts were passed, the Massachusetts legislature is dissolved. And Gage, Thomas Gage, is appointed governor. He will call for elections, for new elections for the new assembly. Um, the response is not very exciting. Uh, he's not even able to call the assembly back together because not enough elections are held. Not enough people are willing to sit in this new legislature, legislature created by the British world appointed governor. Uh, but those like Adams and Hancock are going to create their own assembly without any legal authority uh, from parliament or the king. They're going to create their own assembly, uh, which is going to meet uh, in different towns in Massachusetts outside of Boston. One of their primary places to meet is a town called Concord, Massachusetts, which I know we'll talk about here in a second. Um, but I know rec- people recognize Concord pretty easily. But uh, they're going to establish their own government. They're going to start establishing their own taxes. They're going to they're going to start taxing the different counties in Massachusetts to help fund this new government. They're doing all of this without any authority given to them, uh, you know, by Great Britain. So you, it's definitely not what parliament wanted to happen by passing these acts and adams and hancock are probably the two most important people that really uh create this you know get this let this new legislature created and inspires other colonies like virginia and others i say virginia because i'm in virginia today but inspire these other colonies to do the same and so once you know one colony does it others see it they can do it successfully you start to see the other colonies start to create their own uh legislatures to run the colony awesome um we've got a couple of important british people here as well but i know you've already talked about thomas gage but the main question here really is how involved was king george the third in in all of this um that's a you know that is a great question and i i, I think involved a little bit but not as much as we're probably taught in our history books. Uh, you know, this is, you know, Lord North, this is, you know, the prime minister, this is the parliament's uh, kind of deal. Um, you know, uh, you know, you know, the king at this point in time uh, had some authority, but not as much as, as they did, you know, 200 years before this point. Um, so very, very, very tangential as far as the authority he had. Uh, but really this is going to fall in parliament and those in the cabinet and obviously Thomas Gage you have there on the screen there too uh, you know he's going to have to make a lot of decisions on his own without any input um, back from London because it takes 
such a long time mm -hmm. for information to get back forth. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. When he when Gage gets to London, um, he eventually will write uh, a few letters um, back. I mean, when he gets to Boston. Sorry, and he'll write a few letters back to London. And trying to say that this situation is much worse than you all thought. He, he says, if you think I need a thousand men, give me 10,000. If you think I need 10,000 men, give me a hundred thousand. If you think I need a hundred thousand, give me a million. So he's trying to tell his bosses over in London, we need more, we need more men over here. And this situation is much worse than you all thought. They thought by just, putting a military governor in, in control of the, of the colony, sending troops over to Boston, that the people in Boston and Massachusetts would be like, oh, okay, well, you know, we're going we're gonna to behave now. It, that's not what happened. And he has a very he, – he has the hardest job of anyone in this story. Mm -hmm. You know, his wife is an American. Um, he, he's enjoyed living in North America. Uh, he – kind of feels the plight of some of these people in Massachusetts. He kind of he kind of understands where they're coming from. He doesn't agree with them. I'm not trying to say that by any stretch of the imagination, but he, he understands the situation they're in, but uh, he still thinks that, you know, they need to respond to the authority to, of the law. And he gets over there and, and realizes that, uh, this is not going to. This is not an easy situation, and people in London, Parliament, the King, Prime Minister, are not placing enough emphasis on the situation. He thinks that, as I said earlier, he thinks he needs more men, more supplies, more support, um, and he's going to get very frustrated with the lack of support he's going to get um, from Great Britain. Mm -hmm. Excellent, and. We get to the point where there is no turning back and you're going to be really disappointed because that is a podcast for another day. <laughs> I know you were dying to talk about the minute, man. And, oh, my gosh. And Lexington and Concord, <laughs> one of your favorite battlefields, probably. But that is a podcast for another day. Um, but anyway, what we are going to talk about, though, is, is this amazing thing. So we have Emerging Revolutionary War. And uh, so you're a co-founder. Um, you've right. written a few books uh, recently. Mm -hmm. You guys are doing a similar thing to what ECW is. So just tell us about the the foundation of it and and how it all started and all that. Yeah, sure. So and thank you, thank you for that. Um, so Emerging uh, Revolutionary War is a branch off from a group called Emerging Civil War, which is uh, a group of public historians that started a blog online, and we did the same with a blog focusing on the American Revolution. We also talk about the French Indian War and the War of eighteen twelve. Even though we're called the Revolutionary War, we kind of do all the early American from French Indian to to War of eighteen twelve. Um, so we have a blog, but we also have a book series. Where I think we're my book, I have a new book coming out about the Battle of Camden it's, that went to printer today, by the way. Um, that will be our seventh book in the series. Uh, we also do um, videos. We do a podcast, much like your podcast, focusing on different revolutionary war topics with authors, historians. Uh, we really focus on what we call public history, which is to promote the historians in the field that work at museums, work at historic sites. Uh, our goal is to get people to go to these places. It's great to read a 500 page book about something and I do that a lot but it's also I think more meaningful um, if you can actually go visit some of these places so you can actually experience the place and, and learning in places is a big thing that we believe in um, we all do this uh, our, our emerging revolutionary war that we call ERW for short we all do it for free it's a nonprofit group we all have full-time jobs elsewhere but this is where we share a passion uh, for early American history and and kind of uh, share that with as many people that are willing to listen. Um, it's just, again, promoting historic sites, promoting museums, and promoting people visiting some of these places to learn this history. Like I talked about today, I was mentioning some of the places you can you can see. You can go to Carpenter Hall today. You can go uh, to Boston today and, and see where Griffin's Wharf, Wharf used to be. Uh, some of these places still exist in the States that you can kind of go. And, and it's just kind of, for me, it's a better, a better situation for me to learn by actually being there. Uh, and I know you feel the same way about you know uh, Civil War sites as well. It's just being on these battlefields and these sites and, and reading about them and going to them just provides a much better experience and a much fuller understanding of this history. 
Awesome. And ladies and gentlemen, I will leave links to Emerging Revolutionary War below. So they like like Rob said, they have a website. So go and have a look because it's fantastic. Um, anything that you would like to add that we've missed apart from the Battle of Lexicon and Concord, <laughs> uh, Rob, before we say goodbye? No, uh, uh, people, we, we had this debate um, among our uh, emerging revolutionary war group. Um, why did the war? Why did America break away? Why did the colonies leave? Um, and there's lots of different reasons, but um, the two reasons I always come back to is geography. Great Britain is a long way away from North America, um, and and having these colonies be established so far away, uh, just, you know, created a situation they could go separate. Um, Long-term relationships, sometimes, most of the time, do not last. <laughs> and and secondly, I think it's cultural. Um, you know, uh, most of the colonists were settled by British citizens, had direct and close, intimate connections with Great Britain. But then you start seeing other, uh, you know, groups of people. My family came over in 1712. They were from Germany. You see these other different groups coming over from Europe and other parts in the world that didn't have that British connection. And then, of course, you have the, the, the Native American population here, too. Uh, I think, you know, it created its own culture. Uh, and you started to see the, the lack of that direct connection back to the, to the homeland of Great Britain. So I always say, you know, uh, it, not to simplify it, but geography and culture, uh, to me, the two biggest reasons why these events we talked about today uh, took place and, and eventually led uh, to, you know, 1776, uh, the colonies declaring independence. Well, thanks for that. And all that's left to say is thank you, Rob. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. It's been fun.